And I'd also be very grateful if all the panelists uh, who's available is able to switch on their cameras so we could have a discussion about those cases and potentially other questions that have come through on the chat. Thank you very much. Um, start off, I think, just by asking about the case I presented. Um, if you do have a sort of a clinical suspicion of long QT3, uh, would any of the panelists advocate starting mixilatine um, in the absence of any sort of genotype information, if you might otherwise be a little bit, uh, you know, reluctant to, to give bisoprolol? Is it fair of me to comment, Chris? Please do. Well, since I know the case. Um, I think mixilatine uh, is, is very useful in the LQT3 population and can be in the LQT2, and I don't think it's going to do any harm. Um, so I would think it's it's reasonable to consider trying it, and you can do it as a challenge um, or a lidocaine challenge alternatively, but you can do it oral. I think it's, I think two doses of 100 milligrams um, over a four hour period and, and monitoring the ECG or, um, or give an intravenous lidocaine challenge and see if it shortens the QT interval. Um, and if you get a good response, then you could continue oral things in the team subsequently. So I think those could be could be useful. I don't know whether it will help with the sinus bradycardia. Um, I don't know if I ever saw the results of the lidocaine challenge in this in this woman, but um, in theory, it may have some effects on some of the some of the abnormalities of function. Yes, so interestingly, this lady did undergo a lidocaine attenuation challenge, uh, which did show shortening of the QT interval during various points uh, after the infusion was started. And in collaboration with uh, with multiple colleagues, um, mixalatine was offered, but I think the uh, the athlete concerned preferred not to prefer to avoid medications. And later down the line, uh, the genetic testing did confirm a um, gain of function mutation or variance within the sodium channel gene, which was very interesting. Uh, she was given all of the suitable lifestyle advice uh, for competition, as well as involvement and involvement of the, um, the sports bodies and availability of defibrillation, etc. So I think it was a very interesting case to highlight that you know, sometimes the mainstay treatments might not be appropriate uh, or even tolerated. She does remain a worrying case, of course, if she's refusing therapy. Yeah. Uh, with that degree of QT prolongation and bradycardia underestimates the QTC correction with Bazet. So um, the QTC is more likely if you did it with Federicia to be close to 600, I would think. And so um, she she's declined mixilatine even after her genetic diagnosis, has she? She competed without mixilatine and then started it um, after competition. So she's now taking that drug and has showed a great therapeutic response to mixilatine in terms of absolute QT shortening. Lovely, really, really interesting in case. I might touch on some of the questions. We had a few questions that come through on the uh, uh, chat and I, I might direct this one. Uh, at, at you, Rachel, if you don't mind. Uh, there was a comment about the measurement of QTC intervals uh, in, in uh, ECGs of QRS prolongation. So patients with bundle branch block patterns, I presume that's yeah. um, gearing towards. I, I think there are different methods and there are various formulas that have been uh, put out as, uh, as ways to correct the QT interval for patients with bundle branch block patterns. I don't know that any of them are perfect. I don't know. I will hand over to Michael and Elijah to comment if you know differently. I, I think um, some people have advocated measuring instead the JT interval, so the sort of J point to the end of the T wave. And there's another formula where you measure the QRS duration and take off 50 percent of that uh, to uh, to to then um, create your 
your your QT interval, which you correct uh, in an otherwise similar way. Um, so I think that there are lots of different ways that have been proposed. I don't know that any of them are perfect, um, but they can give you a good approximation. Um, but Elijah and Michael, I don't know if you use or do anything differently to me. Um, I didn't see what you did, Rachel. Sorry, because I, I had to, I had to briefly go to another meeting, um, so I'm not sure what method to use. I just tend to be, I tend to bear it in mind and, and not, not be too fussy about the QT interval because it is such a, it is such a variable measurement, um, and if you're dealing in borderline cases, then you, you, you taking away 20 or 30 milliseconds here or there isn't really going to help you enormously. Um, so I, 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 I tend to look at the dynamics of the QT interval and what the gene testing results show and what family testing shows. Thank you. There's actually a question from the chat for you, um, Elijah, just from your earlier talk. Uh, the question is, have any genetic variations been particularly linked to increased RVOT collagen disposition in Brugada syndrome? Short answer, Chris, no. Love it. And we've got another question uh, which I'll direct to uh, uh, Jonathan. Um, how often do the uh, wireless pacing systems uh, fail and to what extent is it possible to replace the impart implantable portion of that device? Yeah, so the um, so there's a couple of answers to that. The, the, the leadless, uh, so the leadless pacing systems, I think they were referring to that and possibly the wireless LV one, I'll comment on both. The, the leadless systems uh, don't uh, fail with a, with a particularly high degree of, uh, 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 of certainty in the sense that, that you implant them as you would a pacemaker and you wouldn't uh, leave them in unless you were happy uh, with the implant. In terms of the actual failure rate comparing with the transvenous lead, um, it's it's minuscule. So the rate of uh, attrition of uh, a micro, which is probably what the greatest clinical experience is with, um, is probably less than, I think, less than half a percent from the data that I've seen. So very, very small. Um, certainly over the, the medium term outcomes, which is the some of the data that I presented and some of the data that's, that, that will be compared between transvenous and leadless devices, um, it doesn't look like the attrition rate is anything like that of um, uh, pacing, if anything, it's comparable or better. Um, the the leadless LV pacing, which I briefly mentioned at the end, which was with respect to wireless CRT or, or bimetricular pacing, is a, a different beast altogether. That is a different system that relies on both um, the electrode, which is implanted in the LV, and an ultrasound transmitter and battery. And uh, that's a much newer technology and not as iterated as the uh, leadless RV single chamber device. Um, and that does have some uh, uh, attrition rate uh, and they're on kind of gen two or three of that device. So uh, those, those are kind of two different answers. Oh, sorry, two different answers for two different um, systems. Thank you. Um, I do have a device related question uh, as well. Just um, subcutaneous ICDs and patients with the ICCs, particularly younger patients with Brugada syndrome. Um, have you run into any problems with T wave over sensing and those that may show dynamic ECG appearances like Brugada? Yeah, so. Um so we, we don't implant a lot of them at St Thomas's. I, I suspect we'll end up implanting more as as the data builds. Um, there is good data on uh, on all patient groups that includes uh, uh, patients with ICC. Um, I don't know what the St George's experience is, but I know that colleagues across London do implant a lot of patients with Brigada and have had success with it. Um, from some of the registries I've seen, particularly a recent Italian one, I believe around kind of 20% of patients, 15, 20% were not able to have the uh, SICD because they screened out due to the uh, the T wave. So the filter that, that checks for whether um, the device will be able to de adequately detect things um, or not, uh, they screen out in about 20% of cases. So um, I, I suspect around 80% of patients you can probably implant. Um, some people again advocate using exercise testing. Not everyone does that. Um, <clears throat> Elijah, I don't know if, if you do anything differently at George's um, or your experiences of, of using the SICDs in the Brugada patients. Um, I think if they, if they have a, 
a dynamic type one on their 12 lead halter or on their exercise test, then um, I'd be very cautious about their template and ensuring their template is really successful. Um, if they if they've got a very fixed type one pattern, then I think the standard template should be OK to tell you whether it's useful or not. In general, I, I haven't had any significant problems with over sensing in these in these patients, but it's not a lot. And um, you know, thankfully, um, I know some colleagues give Ashmoline, um during the uh, templating to to see if the template will change with Ashmoline. I, I don't think I would rely on, on, a, on a physiologically um, challenging um, uh, test. We, I think we already discussed, Mike and I, how this is really quite a you know quite an, an aggressive and non-physiological challenge. I don't know if I'd be happy to rely on that and say it's all okay based on an Ashmolean test that gave you a good template. Um, or a reasonable template, um, so I, I I don't use it personally myself. Yeah. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, I think in order to keep to, uh, relatively to time, I would, I would like to thank all of our uh, panelists uh, for for the discussion. Very interesting questions, and thank all our speakers uh, for the afternoon. I think it's been a really uh, enjoyable uh, and informative, and I hope all the attendees have enjoyed. Uh, the session as well. So thank you very much all for, for uh, your talks and your contributions to the discussions. Um, I think that I just finished with a bit more housekeeping. I started with housekeeping, I'll finish with housekeeping. Um, you will, everyone who's attended will get a, uh, an email with uh, evaluation forms and the MCQ questions. On completion of that, you will be sent an attendance certificate um, as well. Uh, and again, another opportunity to plug the next session, which uh, is on aortopathies and pregnancy in ICC, and that will be on the 15th of June. So please register for that. Uh, that will be promises to be another very uh, interesting day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.